Hi and welcome to the second part of installing DSpace using the Ubuntu server software. In the previous procedure we uh, installed the Ubuntu server in a virtual machine and uh, in this section we're going to prepare the Ubuntu server for the installation of DSpace later. Just to recap, there's a picture of me and uh, here are my details, contact details, uh, details about me if you want to follow up with me. Uh, I'll leave there for a while just for you to see. And uh, the Ubuntu server software is there and the Oracle VirtualBox software is there. So we have an Ubuntu server ready and I'm going to start it up. That will be almost as if I'm walking into the server room and switching on the server. So let's do that. Let's start VirtualBox and start off um, that DSpace server that we installed yesterday. So here it is already. So I'm just going to click on start to get the thing on and then just to put this outside, I'll put that away so we can see what's happening here. So now imagine that I'm now in the server room and I switched on the start button or pressed the start button on the server and the server is now starting up because we'd like to I'd like to demonstrate remotely logging into the server so this is a virtual demonstration of starting a, a server and there it goes starting all procedures mm, we'll just wait for it to start up I just want to mention that I might pause every now and again when something takes some uh, a long time Okay, so we're going to log in to the server as if it is in the uh, server room and the password is 09 Ubuntu09 That's up there, I got the password right It doesn't seem like it, okay, D space 09 Ubuntu09 Okay, so there we are, we're logged in So just to be able to connect remotely to the server, we want to know what interface what IP addresses are available so there we have we can see with ether 0 we have 192.168.2.7 and with ether 1 we have 192.168.56.101 so we'll connect to the ether 0 uh, remotely so now we have the uh, you can take note of the IP address but I've got it in my head it's 2.7 so I'm going to exit here there we are and then I'm going to minimize this and this is virtually the same as walking out of the server room after starting it up so I'm going to minimize that and now we need to start a terminal to connect to the remote server so with Ubuntu we type Control Alt and T on the on the keyboard and to start a terminal and there's a terminal so now I want to connect to the uh, remote server I imagine now I'm back in the office sitting behind my desk on using my Ubuntu desktop software and I've opened a terminal and now I want to connect remotely to the server. There are several methods to connect remotely. I will go through them uh, just now, but I just want to demonstrate the connection uh, the from yesterday. It was yesterday it was 29, today it's 27. It just all depends on my local virtual box, what IP addresses are assigned. So we're going to log in as a DSpace user to the remote server. So it asks me do I want to accept the fingerprint? Yes, I do. And then I put in the pass at 09 Ubuntu 09. Sorry, I probably typed the password wrong again. 09 Ubuntu 09. Okay, there we are, we're in the server. And if you type lsb underscore release dash a. Dash A, you can see it's an Ubuntu 1404 trusty server, and it's running kernel version. I type you name the A. It's running kernel 420-35, the latest kernel. So, with this machine yesterday, when I did the server installation, we did all the good system administration stuff. Is we updated the server, so it's running the latest and greatest software. Um, just to make sure that today we have the latest and greatest, let's do it again. We're going to get update update the software sources list, and then password for that 
So now, as good system administration practice before beginning uh, any major work on a server, is always make sure the software is up to date. So I'm just applying best practice here to make sure the software is up to date and ready for us. Let me just wait for that to finish. Okay, and then we do the upgrade. There we go, that's the good news. Everything's up to date, everything's good. So we are ready to do, uh, to prepare the server for uh, um, a DSpace installation later. So let's go to the documentation. Let me open my Firefox browser. It's going to take a while. There we go, because I'm going to. Okay, now I'm going to put the browser to the left hand side so that we can see the terminal, remote login, and we can see the. So, the, uh, so we go to the wiki, wiki.lib.sun.ac.za. We click here, as I mentioned yesterday. We go down to the installation link and click on the installation link. So yesterday we completed procedure one. Today we're going to complete procedure two, which is preparation of the Ubuntu server for installation. So let's go and click on there. Okay, so the first step it mentions here is to log into the remote server. Um, there are several steps here. We'll go through them as I go through the preparation and um, review or highlight important parts. So step one is normally the, the, the first step to log in the remote server. Okay, um, logging into the remote server, there's assumptions that you have the SSH server software installed, that you installed using the DSpace user account, uh, and that you have a proper host name to connect to the server with. Okay, if those requirements are met, um, you have some options to log in. You can log in with a Microsoft Windows desktop, like this, uh, if we click on here. You can use PuTTY to log in remotely, or WinSCP. PuTTY gives you a remote terminal when you're on a Microsoft desktop. And there are some instructions to log in using PuTTY from a Microsoft machine. And there are some instructions to use WinSCP to access the files on the server uh, when you use a Windows desktop. So if we go back to step one, and we look at option B, in, uh, to log in with the remote desktop, aka Windows Server Mode. In other words, you want to log into the server and have it return a graphical user interface like Windows Server does. You click on option B, and the first step is to install a uh, a desktop environment on the server and I recommend you install the XUbuntu desktop it's a very lightweight desktop environment then the second step is to uh, log out of the server um, go back to Windows and then via RDP uh, connect to uh, your remote um, Ubuntu server and it will give you a graphical environment and then open a terminal on that um, open that terminal with that graphical environment so that's the one option and then the one I'm going to be using is to log in with an Ubuntu desktop uh, which I have so there I had typed a control alt T and I logged into the server using the um, username and that host name and the host name was, uh, wasn't specified because it's a virtual machine um, but I used the IP address 192.168.2.7 and uh, if you want, it's very handy when you're doing upgrades, you can, and if you're using an Ubuntu desktop, you can use the Ubuntu Unity File Manager and actually log in remotely so you have a graphical file management system going. Uh, and very handy um, when doing upgrades um, and uh, very, very um, highly recommended. So obviously my recommendation is to um, install uh, an Ubuntu desktop somewhere on a piece of spare hardware or whatever or as a virtual box and use that to log in remotely so the, for the rest of the procedure will be um, according to using an Ubuntu desktop to log in remotely okay so once you've logged in remotely as I have here we logged in remotely what do we do we go to the next step we just click here to go to the next basically what has happened Okay, the next step is just to review the nano editor. We're going to use it a lot. So, uh, and just to type it here, I'll type nano so that you get an idea of what it is. So you type nano, and this is nano. If you look at the bottom here, um, you can see that little 
and sign name means control so that is control G that's control X and that's control O and control J and so forth the commands we use mostly here is to when to save stuff in the editor is control O to exit the editor is control X and to delete a line in the editor is control K and that is what you mostly use and this one is also handy show line numbers and um, because um, most of the configuration says refer to line number so such and such in the config file and nano by default doesn't show line numbers but uh, you can switch on line numbers and you just press control C to switch on line numbers and there you see now it's got line numbers and it says line one of one so now you can find yourself another handy thing is to search for a certain string inside the config file and there you type control W and you type in the search string so let me demonstrate here, yeah, control W, I press control W there, now it's looking for a search string, now I just type search, search, S-E-A-R, search, for example, search not found. And another handy one is to search and replace, and that's control and backslash, is to use control and backslash, so I'll type the control and the backslash, and there it says search for, and search and replace it with, S-E-A-R search. There we go. And that uh, concludes a brief introduction um, to Nano. I suggest get uh, start Nano up and get used to it. If you want more help using a Nano on the command line, of course, there's the, always with Linux, Unix, there's the man, and you type man Nano, and you should have some help about using Nano from the man. Uh, again, Nano stands for Nano's Another Editor Enhanced Free Pico Clone. Okay, so this is the man page. As it says at the bottom there, press H for help or Q to quit the man page. So we press Q and we're back there to the command line. We type clear to have a nice clear command line there. Okay, so spend some time um, using the nano editor. We're going to use it a lot. So the next step, the next step is to install the first step is to install the Java software dependencies. Now during the installation and using task select, because we selected Tomcat to install, it should have installed the default GRE, or the default Java runtime environment. Um, also, uh, when after the installation and we set up the repositories, we must make sure that the partner repository is enabled because that's where the um, Java software comes from. If you're using 12 or 4 uh, Ubuntu and DSpace versions 4.2, greater than 4.2, then follow these instructions to uh, uh, set up the Java environment and upgrade Java uh, because 4.2 on 12 or 4 needs a more recent Java version. But we're using Ubuntu 14.04, so we don't have that problem, and we're using DSpace 5.5. So the first step install Java. So we'll, uh, again, as I said earlier, if you can click the left button, drag it across here, select all of that, uh, so it all turns orange with the white back, white text color, and then you right click and you select copy, and you go to the terminal, and you right click and you select paste, and you press enter, and there you go. It executes that command, and we just type a capital Y to accept that, and now it's going to download all the <coughs> software and dependencies again if this was done on a windows machine you would have to go out and download every single independent piece of software obviously some of these software dependencies are because this is an ubuntu system but it does demonstrate how really how convenient it is to use ubuntu and have the software dependencies um, be resolved for you um, without having to worry too much about it so I'm going to pause there and wait for that to happen and then I'll come back to you. Okay, I'm back. The software downloaded and installed. Um, I just want to make a note here. Some people may wonder why we're installing that as well. That will be required later on for the Mirage theme. And it's also a good idea to have the development kit installed uh, if you're doing source, uh, if you want to modify the source code. Okay, so the next step is to see what Java alternative is actually going to be used. So we again copy and paste into the terminal and we press enter. And we see that is the Java version that will be installed. 
and that is the Java version installed and that will be used by the installation and that is the same as we got here on the documentation it's basically the same yes okay so we have a Java 1.7 installed and here's a screenshot from an actual DSpace installation showing the Java version there that's the Java runtime version that will be used the next thing for compiling source Java source code we need the ant compiler so we put that in and make sure that's installed copy and paste and there we go ant is being installed so there we go in this step we have installed all the required Java software dependencies so we're good with that so we go to the next step step three step four yeah, we want to join, install the Maven Java wall builder um, to install it we type this command here so let's do that cut, copy and paste install it with that command and just press enter to select yes and there the software is installed while the software is installing, I just wanted to make some notes. Um, yeah. Again, this is a note if you're using Ubuntu 12 or 4 and by the Java versions. So, again, this is not applicable to us. We are using Ubuntu 1404, not 1204. Um, if you are behind a proxy uh, or, or, and, and the um, and the bull doesn't occur because it can't uh, Maven can't download um, software from the internet, I suggest you follow this these settings here. As you type that command um, to set up your Maven settings, and then look at these parameters here and type in the same parameters. Uh, on your site to be able to um, for a maven to be able to download um, softwares from behind a proxy so here you just give it an ID in my proxy for example you say you're using a proxy the protocol is HTTP and here you put in the host uh, host address of the proxy server here you put in the port number of the proxy server here you put in any credentials that's required to log into the proxy server your username and yeah you put in the password okay so this is not applicable to us because we have an open connection to the internet we don't have to go through a proxy but um, please remember if you have a proxy you must set it up in the maven config file for um, uh, to enable maven to download um, to download softwares okay so there maven is installed so let's go and check the Maven version. We type Maven-V. So let's type that. MVN-V should not come back with a Maven version. So there we see Maven version. We've got Apache 305, which is fine. It's only required for them, with Java 1.7. So we're getting a, a step closer to being prepared to install DSpace. So we have Maven. We have Java installed. We have Ant installed. So what's the next step? All right. Step five. Now we need to make sure that we have the big business, the main actor, the Tomcat Java web server installed properly. Just some notes uh, how this differs from the official DSpace. We do not use mod JK in this installation. We don't uh, use Apache 2 port redirection and we don't even install the Apache 2 server. This is not required with our installation. Please. This is just extra technology and extra service overhead on the server that's not required. This procedure enables Tomcat security um, and uh, I suggest uh, that you carefully check your Tomcat security after install. If you want to do URL rewrites as you did with Apache 2, you're welcome to use this uh, Java software. If you want to enable Shibboleth with Java, you're welcome to use this software. So, since we are using Ubuntu 404, we click here to uh, follow that procedure for 14.04 and we say we will install the Tomcat 7 
job web server and then we do copy and paste and we press enter and it says Tomcat 7 is already installed or the newest version this Tomcat was installed when we did the task selector in the installation but I've put it here in case some people install Ubuntu server without uh, viewing my instructions so yes it might be a repetition but this is just in case people do their own Ubuntu server installation but then follow my preparation and haven't used task select and it's also a good fail safe backup uh, to make sure that it's done twice and, and repeated twice now where we differ completely from the D spaces we are now going to make sure that Tomcat listens on port 80 and 443 which are the default ports for normal HTTP and secure HTTP normal HTTP listens on port 80 and secure HTTP listens on port 443 so how do we tell the Tomcat server to listen on these ports instead of port 880 and 8443 the first step is to make sure uh, that we configure Tomcat to do that now with Ubuntu and Debian systems the folder etc default allows you to set up config files for services so without having to modi modify the service config files themselves so in that etc default folder is normally config files for all the services so let's mo mo modify the Tomcat server, uh, services file and we do the copy and paste thing again and press enter and here we have the Tomcat config file on DSpace so it's not a big config file uh, we just got to modify a few things to make sure we use port 18 and 443 the first thing we want to do is we want to enable auth bind so we go down to the config file look for auth bind and see it's there remove the hash sign to enable this configuration change the no to a yes and then save the file control O to save it remember the nano instructions so there it says they remove the hash sign in front of the auth bind parameter and change auth bind to yes as follows so there you have it so we've uh, saved the file now we get out of nano control x the next thing is now we've got to tell auth bind the ports so we uh, create the port parameter but copy and paste and paste that in there so we want to do auth bind by port 80 port 443 and we paste that in to make for the secure port then we give the execute permissions to those two port parameters port 80 and then execute permissions for port 443 as well and we paste that in there again now we tell um, the auth bind that only Tom, the user tomcat 7 may use these ports so we set that up port 80 and port 443 and paste that in there now we're going to have a look at what this looks like how do the what do the files look like so that you can check your installation and we copy that now we're in the as you can see now we are in that folder and now we want to see what the files in that folder look like we just copy and paste there and we paste this in there and we can see so there are two uh, files one allowing us to use port 80 with Tomcat and one allowing us to use port 43, 443 with Tomcat which gives us the same I've done a screenshot or in a previous installation and it's basically the same so we're quite happy that looks good so the next thing is now to tell Com Tomcat to use these ports we've made these ports available to Tomcat now we must tell Tomcat to actually use them so we type in this command just to get I just want to type cd again just to make things clean and then type clear cd means go back to the uh, home folder or your home directory clear means clear the screen like that just so that you don't get confused with what's happening there now the next step is to tell Tomcat to use those ports so we open this copy and paste and we open the server config file the actual server config file and we look for the port 8080 connector so we scroll down here and we look for the port 8080 connector I'm going down, keep going down, keep going down and there's the connector port 8080 so what you want to do there's quite a few things to change um, some of this stuff is was added um, 
to make this production enabled. So what we're going to do, we will, to make this simple, is we're going to remove all of this section and then copy and paste that section on the website. And, and I'll show you how you do that using Nano. So we go Control K to delete everything there. Press space, press enter there, and now we're ready to paste it in. So we go back to the documentation here, and we copy, select it, copy, go back to Nano here, and paste it in. And now we have a nice clean paste of this. So it's using protocol HTTP one, enable lookups, and it load, it gives it now a production look and feel. And then to save that, we press Control O to write it out, and now we save that. So that concludes setting it up on port 18. Um, to set to tell Tomcat to listen on port port 3, I suggest you follow those instructions there. So for the moment, I'm going to skip that uh, for this demonstration because we're not going to use the secure port in our demonstration. And we, uh, that can be an exercise later uh, that you can review uh, at that wiki page. So we exit the Nano Editor and we're going make sure now the next step is to make sure tell Tomcat um, which users uh, have authority to access Tomcat um, by the web so we monitor via this file yeah and we paste it in here so there it says they delete all the contents of the file and add the following admin management roles so there's actually no content here if you see it it's all commented out so we can delete all the contents as it says there and we just copy and paste what's in the documentation and we go to the documentation and copy and paste this yeah and paste that in there all right so the username to log in the password 09 ubuntu 09 i'm just using the dspace username and password you i suggest you don't use that to secure your server use another username and password uh, to to uh, access the server, but just for the demonstration, I'm using the same credentials as the uh, Linux username and password that we've already used default, and that is DSpace and the password 09 Ubuntu 09. To save that again, just type Control O in DSpace, press Enter to write it out, Control X to leave. No, no. Now the next thing we want to tell uh, the Tomcat web server how much Java how much memory it may use for its Java runtime. So we copy and paste that and we go back to the default Tomcat 7 file and we look at that and we see down here that it has the Java opts as you see there, there's the Java opts parameters uh, there's the default parameters sorry I just get this one else. here's the default Java opts um, here by default They've added the in this Java version the com mark sweep by default, and then using 128 um, megs RAM. You just simply change that value there to the amount of RAM you want to assign to the Java web app server. Okay. So for this machine, because we are using one, yeah, we've uh, have uh, one gigabyte RAM. I think we get safe to use 512 megabyte for the server and leave 512 megabytes. Uh, for the Ubuntu server and we use 512 megabytes just for the Java web app server. So to save that control O, write that out and then control X to re leave the Tomcat 7 config file. But in addition um, uh, just for your reference this is what we um, set up with our web server as a minimum um, but now we have plenty of um, RAM available on our server um, which we'll take up later on the next thing uh, is to switch on the Tomcat security very important so let's go back to the Tomcat config file copy and paste and open it this one might sound a bit repetitive but this is just for you to get used to this procedure of where the Tomcat configuration is. So we go down to where Tomcat security is and we switch it on. We move the hashtag and turn it to yes and switch it on. Control O to write it out. Control X. 
So we've turned Tomcat security on with yes. But now we need a DSpace security policy and this will be required for later installations of uh, other stuff. So to create a DSpace security policy for Tomcat, we copy and paste that and we paste this in here. And we're there. It's an empty file, it's a new permissions file and then we copy and paste this into that file. And we copy and then we paste that in there and we write that out to save it and then control X sorry control X to get out of no no then to make sure we have the right permissions that so Tomcat can read it we type that command to give Tomcat uh, permissions to use that policy and then finally not finally but but now we can now restart the Tomcat server by typing this command so that it will use the new Tomcat uh, permission ports etc so let's restart the tomcat server there stopping it and starting it if you don't get an ok yeah I suggest go and check everything you've changed until you get an ok there sometimes you may have um, configured something incorrectly and you get a fail there when you get an ok there on the restart we're good you can continue ok now we just want to make sure that um, uh, the DSpace user can run as the Tomcat user. So we type these to sort out the permissions, execute permissions, and we type them. We make sure DSpace is part of Tomcat, and Tomcat is part of DSpace. So we paste that in there. Okay. Again, we can do the restart there. Um, it's probably a good idea after doing those permissions. Okay, a bit of a repeat, but again, helps you become familiar with the procedures and how to do the Tomcat setup. Okay, then we have an okay there. Now, after Tomcat, we want to check that it's listening on the correct ports. So we copy that command, paste it in there, and we see. Okay, there we go. Tomcat is listening on port 80. That is as exactly as we would have wished it and it's using that interconnect port there as well but the most important part here is it's listening on port 80 now not port 8080 right um, to ensure um, that you've done your optimizations correctly i suggest follow that link and then check there also remember only one server at a time may listen at on any port so you can't try and start two services listening on the same port 80 for example so you can't have two tomcats and have them both listen to port 80 if you have two tomcats running they must have must listen on two different ports so the first one can listen on port 80 and the second one on port 8080 but we are only going to use one tomcat and therefore we are only listening on one port again uh, you may need to reboot your server if you want to get make sure that everything is properly working on ports 18 and and then later on um, just to prepare yourself and we'll go through that as procedure 3 how to set up the default root web app for Tomcat so that when it restarts which application it will present as the default application okay so I think that concludes our Tomcat installation so we are ready to go for the next step this is the big one, this is quite a big step, so go through it carefully, it's the important step, it's the one that standardizes and normalizes the Tomcat on port 80 and port 443, and uses the auth bind, sets up the permissions, etc, etc, and the Java environment. So now we're on step 5, oh sorry, we go back, now we're the next, we go back uh, to that step, now we go to the next step, step 6. Then that, that involves installing the PostgreSQL database. Very important. Why do we use PostgreSQL and not Oracle? Well, it's open source. And we believe this is in keeping with the open access pathos. So, um, I suggest before beginning, just make yourself familiar with the connection bug. 
that's a persistent uh, problem and again look at optimizations for the database since we are using Ubuntu 14.04 we click here to find out how to do the Postgres installation the first thing is we have got to make sure that the uh, server can handle um, the server kernel can handle a uh, maximum PostgreSQL performance. To do that, we modif modify that file and we copy and paste here. And we go down to the bottom of this file, the syscontrol file, and we copy and paste this in here into that file. And we paste that in there, press enter, and try control O to save this file, and then control X. All right, then to make that active, the new parameter in syscontrol, we copy and paste that in there and it activates it. Now we come to the actual PostgreSQL installation. We want to install all the contributions and critical dependencies with it. So we copy and paste that. Remember with the task select in the beginning, we installed the PostgreSQL database, but we didn't install the contribs and the libpg java library so here we do that we press enter and enter again to install those parameters and there we go so now we have the contrips and the libpg installed now we want to make sure that only the dspace local dspace user may connect to the local dspace database that will be created later on to do that we copy and paste these commands in here so let's just do that here let make sure uh, we change permissions correctly. Please review this. Uh, take some time to read up the documentation about this host based access and make sure that you have it correct. This prevents anybody else connecting to the database and only allowing local host connections from the local host, from persons logged into the server. If you need persons from outside the server to log in, then you must set up the correct permissions here in this host-based access control file. So here's an example of it. Um, let me uh, let me display it nicely and then to show you um, compare it on the screen and compare it in the terminal. So I'm going to use the cat command to display it and then I'm sorry, I need permission to do that, so we type there. So there you see, it's the same, basically the same, and we've changed all the connect methods to trust. So this database trusts all local connections. Okay. To make sure that those permissions, connection permissions are enabled, we restart the Postgres database by using this command. So let's restart it. So now the Postgres SQL server is ready for trusting local connections. So the next step with the PostgreSQL is we need to create the PostgreSQL database user, database user. So to do that, we use this command, so we copy and paste, and we create the PostgreSQL database dspace user. So it is going to ask now uh, for the Postgres database dspace user what password. So we're going to use it just to keep for the demonstration post, we're going to keep the same, you keep using the same username password, which is dspace and then 09 Ubuntu 09. It'll ask you to confirm the password, so we go 09 Ubuntu 09. There we go. So now we've created a dspace database, PostgreSQL database user. Now we need to create the actual dspace database. To do that, we must become the Postgres user, who is the master administrator of the Postgres database. So to become the dspace user, we type that command, and we paste it, and we press enter. There, as you can see, now we are virtually logged in as the Postgres user, which is the administrator user for the database. And then we to type this command to create the database when we are logged in as the Postgres SQL user. Here we go. Now it's created the dspace database now we need to set up although we have a dspace database user and we have a dspace database we need to tell 
post source SQL what kind of permissions the DSpace user has on the DSpace database. So we need to follow these instructions. First of all, we connect to the Postgres server as the Postgres user and we modify the Postgres database. This is what it's telling us when we log in there. Now we are actually connected to the Postgres SQL database by this command and we are connected to the DSpace database in the Postgres SQL server. So now we want to give the DSpace user on the DSpace database a password. So we're going to stick with the same nomenclature where there is a DSpace user use the DSpace password which is 09 Ubuntu 09. Now we must tell PostgreSQL that the DSpace user owns the DSpace database. So we type in this command there. Now the DSpace user owns the DSpace database. Now we must tell PostgreSQL to give all privileges on the DSpace database to the DSpace user. So we type that. So now the DSpace user has all privileges on the DSpace database. It owns the DSpace database and it has all privileges on the DSpace database. Also, in addition, um, you want to add this, which is coming with new versions of DSpace. We might require this is the PG Crypto instruction. So we just enable the PG Crypto instruction on the DSpace database. Just enter. There, it's done. So we've done our work on a DSpace database with Postgres, and we just type that to quit. Yeah, just type that to quit it. And then to, we are still virtually the Postgres user. We want to go back to being the DSpace user, so we just type exit to become the DSpace user. Again, here we are now. Now we're back to being the DSpace user. So we've done all our DSpace Postgres SQL database work. Now we need to tell um, the Postgres SQL server who may connect to the DSpace database. So we, we're going to do this work as the administrator so to become the administrator we type that and there you see now we are administrator the administrator on a, on a Linux system is called root or, we, or on a Unix system it's called root and so we type this command as the root user to enable the DSpace user to connect to the DSpace database locally not remotely and there you go Okay, um, there was um, a problem with uh, Postgres SQL Server client connections, and I suggest please review this bug report. But um, just for the purposes of making this production friendly, you copy and paste this, and we're going to uh, enable more Postgres SQL Server connections than the default. So we scroll down the file. Now we are in the config file for the Postgres SQL Server and we're going to go and look where it has the max connections parameter and we're going to change that to 300. So there we see the max connections set up for 100. So we're just going to turn it to 300 so to make sure it can handle more connections. If ha updating or increasing the connection parameter here as it says here, it just notes that you increasing the max connection it costs 400 bytes of shared memory per connection. So that's just something to watch out for. If you increase that connection f uh, value, just remember you'll be using more um, RAM or memory to service those connections. Again, Control O to save this file, press Enter to write it out, and Control X to exit. Now, to make all this happen for the new PostgreSQL server and the new configuration is to restart the PostgreSQL server. And so we type that to restart the PostgreSQL server. And we get an OK on the restart. So everything's good. Our host based access, all our config parameters were good. And so we're ready to go. PostgreSQL server has been installed. So now, if we go back to that step, We've done the Postgres SQL Server and we're all good. Alright, so now we're going on with the next step in the preparation. This one is installing the Postfix mail server. Uh, you need a mail server because you need to send emails uh, in order to facilitate submissions, the workflow of submissions. So this is a critical step. I made some notes here um, about uh, using 
what mail server gateways to use. I have some notes here on using Gmail as your email server gateway. And then I have notes here for using an on-site campus email server as a gateway host. Um, for the purposes of this demonstration, um, I mean because this server is not on the campus, I'm going to demonstrate the installation as if it was on the campus, but we just remember it's not on the campus, so this email delivery may not work. But when you're on the campus, what you need to make this work is you have to find out from your central IT what is the address, the network address, or the host name of the email ser server on campus, the one that sends email, sends email, not the one that receives email. In the Linux world, there are two different services, one for receiving email and one for sending email. So you need to speak to your central IT to find out what is the address of the server that sends email and do you need any credentials to connect to that server? Okay, so I'm going to complete this installation as if this server was on the campus. So the first thing is to make sure that any other email software is not installed, it's to remove it. So just to be safe, it says the XM is not installed, that's fine. What we want to use is the Postfix server. It's a sending mail server, it's not a receiving mail server. So we only want to send mail so we're going to send the send mail server which is postfix and there we press enter to install it now postfix is downloading and now we come to the configuration of postfix so here we are going to select internet with smart host for the installation the smart host will be the email server that delivers email for us on campus so we select we will continue with the installation and i'll demonstrate it so we're going to select internet with smart host and our system mail name is the same as the name of our server, um, local server, so we'll keep that. Okay, now it's asking for the SMTP relay host. And this is the mail server on campus, the one that delivers mail for you on campus. And for us at Stellenbosch University, the server that delivers mail for us on campus is mail.sun.ac.za. And then we click OK. And that's all there is to it. It's that simple. But uh, if there are problems um, with setting this up, I have re um, a review that you can go through in step 7.2. So let's just have a look at it. If we type this and we can look at the parameters in the mail server, mail delivery server, and we can see um, how these compare. Now, if we could scroll down here and we have a look. Um, you see there, my host there is Ubuntu there, is there. Um, the relay host, the important parameter, the relay host there is mail.sun. Okay, so your relay host there, most important parameter, and then all the other default uh, parameters are selected. Those are the most important the relay host and my host name those two parameters. So check them that they are according to what you want. And again, if you don't have a campus mail server, you can use a Gmail server and there are instructions for using the Gmail server uh, for delivering uh, email. Okay, so that gives you an overview. Make sure that everything is correct. Uh, if you want to reconfigure the Postfix server, you just type that command and it will reconfigure the Postfix server. Uh, then in addition to the post installation, we want to make sure we have the correct mail name, so we type that command and we paste it in there and the mail name and we type in our mail name we want Ubuntu and control O to save it and control X to get out. And then we restart. You can then now you can restart the mail service and it should use that new parameter and we have a good restart. Now mail aliases, uh, alias, email aliases are, on, are the same as name aliases like uh, Harry is an alias for Hilton, um, Bugsy is an alias for uh, Al Capone, for example. So we want to set up alias addresses so that any email sent to the DSpace user 
is delivered to you personally as the system administrator. So to do that, we just edit this file here, in the aliases file, and we paste that in there, and we come to this file. So now, any email sent to Postmaster is delivered to the root user. So we want to say, any email sent to the root user is delivered to us as the system administrator. So it's sysadm at my edu dot ac dot za for example so you type in your email address there um, and then any email delivered to the dspace user must also be delivered to you so we set in the same alias for that so you might want to set up another email address for that um, my edu dot ac dot za for example so any if the system sends any email to the root user it forwards it to you automatically. If it sends any email to the DSpace user, it automatically forwards it to you. It's very convenient. And we save the file, control R, and we save control R, the same procedure with nano. And then to make the aliases active, we type that command to activate these new aliases on the on the email server. And we type that there. To test the email delivery, we install these email utilities for the mail utils, so we type them, copy and paste that in there, enter, and it's now installing that, press enter to install the mail utilities, and now we can test our email delivery and see if it works with the following command, yeah. So once the installation is finished, we'll paste that command in there and uh, give our email delivery server a test. So we paste that in there, and we press enter, now we're not going to CC it and to avoid CC we just press enter to so type some content in the subject of the mail we just press anything here on the keyboard and press enter to actually send the email we press control D so press control D for delivery oh sorry we guess sorry I must do that here in this terminal press control D and there it sent off the email to see if the email is successfully installed, we have a look at the email log file. So we paste that in there. So there the email was sent. It was relayed. There, as you can see, I sent it to root. Um, and it went through the relay. No delay. Um, so it seems like everything worked. So the test now would be then to um, go and open your email your university email which I'll do here quickly and to see if the email arrived in the university server, the test server. Uh, it doesn't seem like it worked here, it didn't arrive uh, because this is not a campus, it's not on the campus. Anyway, so that's the next step is then to check in your email account uh, if you received that test email. So please continue through here until you get this correct as I said, uh, if you don't have a campus server, is then um, is to use this um, procedure here for using um, Gmail. There, you can set up Gmail as the as the delivery server. Okay. Please make note of that if you use Gmail. Okay. I can't think of anything else uh, except on this mail server setup. Be careful that your mail server doesn't get abused as a, a relay gateway for spam mail. So please speak to your campus mail administrator about the setup. Make sure that they certify your setup is secure and it won't be used as a relay for spam mail. So that concludes step 7, the next step, uh, step 8. Right, now in this step we want to s make sure that uh, all our environment settings are correct uh, for, for the system. So we just do a few setups quickly to make sure that we have a nice Java environment. We co copy and paste this in here. 
and you see this is a normal path so we just copy this in here for the Java Home and the Java Ops so that we'll use our Java Home and Java Ops for parameters so here we're telling um, Ubuntu or any application wanting to run the Java runtime uh, this is where the Java runtime is and this is how much um, memory to use and so forth so and what encoding to use so for any Java program that runs from the command line or etc we'll then use about 2 gigabytes of RAM uh, and one and a minimum of one gigabyte of RAM. So to save that, you press Control O and press Control X. Then we want to increase uh, the number of open files to make sure the server can handle a lot of load. So we just type that in there, and we go down to the bottom of this file, just before the end of file, and we copy and paste this in here. So we give our server full access to all the open files. And then to server control O, control X to exit. And then to activate it, the limits, we type ulimit n and we paste it in here in the new parameters of setup. To set up permissive uh, file permissions, um, you can see now we're stored here in as the root user, but we want permissive file permissions for the <coughs> these page users. So we exit as the root user, and we now want to manage to uh, modify the these page users bash runtime configuration file, and we make sure that we have a permissive, very permissive file creation mask, and we paste that in there, <coughs> and we save it. Control O. Alright, so we've set up the environment, Java, uh, system files, and bash environment. So the next step, right, the next step is to enable everything, is to reboot the server. And then after the reboot, check that everything will work correctly. So now we do the reboot command, and we wait <coughs> for it to do the reboot. So while it's doing that we can uh, ping that to address and when the ping comes back we know the server has been rebooted don't worry about rebooting a server from your desktop uh, and the server is in the server room the server will go through a, a normal reboot as if it was rebooted uh, with you pressing the reboot button and there we go we see the server is back now we can log back into the server and we use that password 09 I'm going to there are nine. Okay, now if we type PS3, this is not in the documentation, but PS3 means process tree. If we type that, we can now check what services are running. And we see there's 17 Java services running. I assume that's the Tomcat. There we have the Postgres SQL Server service running. So it seems we have everything required to um, to uh, install DSpace. So to check we can actually see if the Tomcat server is running through the web interface by typing those addresses. In. So we're going to open another browser here and theoretically we should be able to connect to our Java web app server before installing DSpace by typing in the host name. In this case we're going to use the IP address 192.168.2.7 if you remember and then we're going to go manager manager sorry manager forward slash html interface and we now should now be connecting there we go remember when we did the tomcat uh, server permissions login permissions we set up the normal dspace username and the normal dspace password so we go in the normal dspace username and we use 09 ubuntu 09 and there you can see. So we have Tomcat uh, with Firefox. I'm just going to remember that in case I log in again. So there we go. We have a working Tomcat web application server running on port 80. We didn't have to use port 8080 there. Okay, it's running on port 80. So we are now ready to install DSpace 
and which will be delivered by this Tomcat web application server. Okay. And that completes step nine. So we've, I think we've completed the preparation. If we go back and just review, yes, we have. Step two, we did nano, we, uh, step one, we reviewed login procedures. We reviewed the nano command line editor. We installed all the, step three, we did all the Java requirements. We installed the Maven Java war builder. We installed the Tomcat server. Uh, we installed the Postgres database server, we installed the Postgres mail server, we configured the environment, or then we checked the installation. So, this part of the procedure is complete. I'm going to finish off this video and create another video for the next step, which is then the installation of DSpace. Thank you very much. Goodbye.